in Sandy, Utah. It is 11 o'clock a.m. Mountain Time. I'm not sure where what time it is where you are, but if you're joining me, I'm grateful that you're here. And if you're watching later on, um, I hope this is a helpful demonstration for you. So as many of you know, um, I do a live stream video every Monday at 11 from my studio. Um, we have begun doing a, um, a series of different uh, tutorials and um, just sharing what I'm working on. We're kind of on a schedule. So uh, the schedule of events, it's on our website, right? On yeah, our events page at the make sure website. They know they're always available to watch afterwards. Okay. And the videos are always available to watch afterwards in the Facebook group. Uh, Collage Quilter Academy Facebook group on the Facebook page, Collage Quilter uh, Facebook page, and on the Collage Quilter YouTube channel. So um, especially watch for the tutorials because we'll do those um, about once a month, I think they're scheduled. So today is the tutorial about using ink tents. Um, so let me just explain what the ink tents are. Where did that, uh, where'd that, there it is. I got a lot of stuff here to show you today. So um my ink tents i use the 24 pack so this is what i will be using today so we sell these ink tents pencils on our website at collagequilter.com and amelia will put the link in the chat as well um, and we also sell the smaller pack so if this is something that you are maybe interested in um giving a try they're not cheap they're but they're the last your whole lifetime <laughs> so anyway um these are this is what i'm using today this is what i'm demonstrating with and um let me just explain that these are very much like watercolor pencils if you've ever used uh, the watercolor pencils or any colored pencil but the idea is that i can color with them and then apply uh, water and it will um, turn to ink. So it saturates into the fabric and then I can heat set it too to ensure that it's a permanent um, addition to the fabric. And I have had just so much fun using ink tents. I don't use them all the time and I don't use them on every project, but for certain things, it, it's incredibly helpful. So I've got a few um, samples to show you um, of when I have used ink tents. Uh, the first one I'll show you is this little wall hanging. Um, did I, I can't remember if I have washed this or not. Um, anyway, so you can see, and I think, I think I could use a little bit more shading, but you can see where I've shaded underneath this love banner. And let me show you another, another version of it. Um, I like this one a little bit better because it's a little more intense, but you can see on this love always where I've used it to define, to give it some definition between the back side of the that fabric ribbon. Um, so wherever you see that kind of shadow, that's where I've used the ink tints. Okay. So there's, um, there's one example of when I've used ink tents. And by the way, this cute little uh, wall hanging for Valentine's Day is, uh, I'm teaching this class at Road to California. So if you are interested in coming and joining me and making this in class, we should be able to get the whole thing done. Um, that is available and the download is available on my website too. So there you go. Um, Amelia, will you take these out of my way? Cause I just have so much to share, show that too. Okay, so another um, another quilt on which I've used the ink tents is the Octopus Garden. Um, you can see I've done some little bubbles on the on this quilt, and I highlighted or just kind of used my um, my ink tents to go around the outside of that and emphasize the the shape of the bubble. So that's another example of when I've used it. And I will be doing a demonstration shortly, but I think it's important to show you when I've used it on other Teacup projects. Oh, whoops, I dropped my teacup. Hang on a second. This is important because I just did this, and this is going to be our demonstration. Okay, so um, 
This is another example of one I've used um, ink tents. This is a really great example. I love this. So this is uh, this is the Clementine. This is a beginner pattern um, that's available on my website. It's actually my very favorite pattern to work with as I'm introducing new collage quilters to this um, art form. And because this is really foolproof and it's so fun. So you can see I've this is an unfinished project. This is a foundation panel um, pattern, and I've used it multiple times to demonstrate to my classes how to what the tech, techniques are for doing the type of collage that I do. But on this pot, there's just a beautiful example of how I've used ink tents. So this is a solid piece of fabric, but I needed it to look dimensional like a pot. Um, and so that was achieved. You can kind of see that it's got a little shadow around it. And that shadow was created using my ink tents. Um, and then I like to show this too, because this is where I, you always have to have a piece of fabric where you can um, test out the color that you're thinking of using before actually applying it to your design. So that's what I've done here. I've just kind of experimented with the color um, you can see I've done it over here as well, and then I applied it to this area of the pot. Um, obviously, it doesn't matter what's going on on this because eventually this will be all covered or cut away. So that's how I've used ink tents on this project. Um, one more example, I was just kind of messing around, same idea, messing around creating some cute little um, vases or pots and again a solid piece of fabric there another solid piece of fabric here um, and then the application of ink tints to kind of create a shadow right there and right here so now um what i'm going to do now is i just a few minutes ago whipped up this cute little yellow teapot okay there's um uh, so this teapot comes from my, or teacup, comes from my Collage Quilter Essentials book. And let's just go back here to the, so here it is in the gray tones, okay? So if I'm a really good Collage Quilter, Collage Quilt artist, I would follow the gray tones. But you can see that there are some areas, it's, it's not really precise. I haven't really nailed it with the fabric. And I did this intentionally so that I can demonstrate how to get some dimension on a project like this, where I there's not enough um, there's not enough value change and there's just not enough dimension. Um, so I chose yellow because yellow is a light color, and um, it all you know it all blends together. Kind of there's just not enough distinction between the cup, there's not enough distinction between the, you know, the, the lip inside the cup and sitting on, you know, the, the, the cup sitting on the little um, plate. So it's just, I, you know, it's just not quite right. And this is again, intentionally, because I want to show you how, when you don't nail something perfectly, your ink tints can kind of help, uh, help you out. So, um, and then when I'm done with that, I'm going to put it on this background. And this is kind of a busy background by design. I haven't done this before, but I think, you know what? Okay, number one, I really like blue and yellow. But the other thing I was thinking as I was preparing this this morning, I thought, you know what? I can come in here after I've applied this to the background fabric and add some more shading onto the background fabric. So we're going to do... We're going to do this process to, together today, okay? Um, and then if we have time, we might get into um, to, into this uh, little project. This is the Orchid that's a down, it's available as a download on Collage Quilter. I'm, I want to rework this design. I like to do that sometimes. And I, I really love this design. I just think this is darling. It will make... Um, a really good quilt block or a wall hanging. I could see it hanging right here. Um, but I want to, I, I want to kind of work on this. So if we have time, we'll get to that. And I also have a few other, um, 
a few other things, designs that are from my Pop Art Pups pattern. So we might, um, we might kind of embellish some of these designs as well. Okay. So I can see as I was looking through my samples, I was looking and thought, oh, you know what, this would be really easy to just demonstrate how to get just a touch more dimension with some of these. So anyway, let's get started. I don't want to take all day because um, I have some fun stuff that I'm looking forward to working on today that I am not even going to tell you <laughs> what I'm doing. Okay, so let me move my my the book that again is available on the website that comes that's where the teapot is coming from. Okay, so I've got another camera here. Let's turn on this other camera and make sure this is going to work. Um, I'm going to leave this on the parchment paper for now. Um, and then we'll peel it off and put it on the background in just a minute. So let's add this other camera and I need to make sure Amelia is moderating comments. Um, so, oh no, I can't take this phone call. Sorry, Ginger. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Okay. Can everybody see me and still hear me? You can see in both of the cameras, I hope. Okay, and I, um, I, I know this is upside down for you, but I'm gonna, I think that's okay. Maybe I'll turn it around. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can, I can go like this. There, I can do that. Okay, so let's get this cord out of the way. Get my drink out of the way and get my ink tense pencils over here. Okay, so here are my ink tense pencils. Let me move that camera just a little bit. Can you make this the teacup full screen? Well, if I do that, it will take the sound off. Oh, right. Okay. So I, I'm not going to make the teacup full screen because we're relying on the computer um, for the sound. We've tried that before. I know we have. Um, okay. So let me um, actually, Emily, hand me, where did I put the book? Let's look at the book one more time. Oh, it's right here. Um, because this has the gray tones in it and I might want to reference that. So if I'm looking at this, I can see, okay, there's, I've done a really crappy job with the, it's okay. I got it. Well, you oh, can't can you see not, it. Oh, you can't see it here. I'll just move this. Okay. So there you go. So you can see, I've done a really not a great job selecting a darker yellow here. And I've got a little bit of. I've done a little bit of what I should do in that area. Um, but again, up here, the lip of the cup is kind of lost. So I need to emphasize this. So those are the areas where I'm going to, that I'm going to work on. And um, I know people will ask often about light source. Um, how do you think about a light source? So the way I want to show you um, a light source so if we look at the if we look at the teacup, we can see um, there might be uh, some mistakes on this light source. But let's talk through this. So if there's a light source up here, let me show you. If there's a light source up here, it's going to cast a highlight there, and then this will be in shadow. Okay, um, same thing. So I'm assuming there's a light source somewhere over here because this is lighter and there's a shadow over here. Um, and, and I guess that works, right? If there's a light source kind of over in this area, this would be lighter and then there's a shadow over here. And obviously um, this down here is in shadow because there's a light source somewhere over here. So I'm just gonna kind of keep those things in mind um, and look at my, my gray tone as I, as I work. So here's my design. Now, uh, to one thing I want to do um, also, Amelia, will you grab, um, let's use, where's the, oh, here it is. Let's use this. We will test some of our colors on this, on this white fabric right here, okay? Um, all right. So the opposite, what I normally do, I actually don't use a lot of gray and I don't use a lot of um, ink black. In fact, this has hardly been used at all because I, 
I, I don't like the look of black, um, but to create a shadow, what I will do instead is pull something that is an opposite color to yellow um, or kind of some dark browns, because if I want to make a brown color that kind of works in here, but I, I might want to make the brown um, pull in some cool colors, some cool purple. So looking at my pencils, I'm going to pull out um, the colors that I'm going to pull out are, um, let's see, I'm going to pull out this one that is called Willow. I'm going to pull out this, which is Violet. And you can see I've actually used Violet quite a bit. Um, so those will probably, if I kind of mix those and then add some water to them, I will probably come up with a good color that will be um, a good shadow on the yellow. Brown is always good with yellow and then adding just a little bit of this purple. And I want to see what this purple color actually looks like. So this is what it looks like uh, before water has been applied. And then if I add water to it, you're going to be amazed at how intense the color becomes. Watch that. Look at that. Isn't that pretty the way that uh, water intensifies the color? So that is the right color, I think. Um, but you can see I don't want to apply that just to the um, to the yellow itself. I think that will still be just too intense. I need it to be more uh, uh, just a, a warmer muted. I really like that combination. So that's what I'm going to use. Um, but I don't want it to be that intense. And then the other thing I want you to see, if you can see, I'll hold it up in a minute, but as I apply water, if I apply too much water, there's going to be a lot of bleed. So one thing when I'm using ink tints, I always like to have, now I do like to use water, um, but if water, if that bleed bothers you and you don't feel like you can control the bleed, try using uh, aloe vera. So aloe vera gel or um, fabric medium, it will control the bleed on your ink tents a little bit. But I like, I, I feel comfortable being able to control the bleed by controlling the water and always having a paper towel to dab up any excess water. So if you watch this, you can see that that pulls up quite a bit of the moisture. And that's one way that I can really control the bleed. So again, the colors that I'm using, I'm going to use violet and I'm going to use willow. So the areas that I feel like I need to define a little bit, I've got a little lip coming right here, but I need to define that all the way across. Okay, so I'm going to kind of draw that out because I lost that when I applied my, uh, my fabric as I was working on the collage. So I'm just going to, now here's the other thing. Um, I don't use ink tents to provide, to create highlights. I use ink tents to create shadow. Um, we'll give it a try because I've got a, a white pencil here, here and we'll just see how that works. Okay, so you can see a little bit of the, um, you can see just a little bit of this definition starting to come in here. Just by that much. What is aloe vera instead of water or is that in addition to the water? Okay, great question. So somebody just asked, would I use the aloe vera instead of water? Yes. Um, you, I, I suppose you could probably mix them. I don't think that would be a problem either. Um, you know, water is just so it's going to run and aloe vera is jelly. So like gel. So um, if the aloe vera is too stiff for you, then you could add some water and thin it down. I always um, remember that when we're using different mediums like this, ink tents or something that you haven't tried before, just be brave and try it. Experiment. That's the, ba the best way to learn is to um, just to try something. So that just helped immensely, right? So now I'm going to take my brush. I've got my little watercolor paint brush here. I'm going to make sure that I've dabbed this so that I don't have a, a whole lot of water there. And I've got, it's got a really beautiful fine tip on it. And as I 
apply just a little bit of water to that. It's again going to really define this. Look at that. Someone said ultrasound gel works too. Ultrasound gel. <laughs> I bet that's aloe vera gel too. <laughs> I, I'm assuming it's probably the same. Look how cool that is. Isn't that fun? You should have taken a before picture. Oh, well, you should have. I should meant to. Right now before you yes, going? I meant to take a before picture. <laughs> Um, you thought that as you were reading. Oh, started. I thought about that earlier. I was, I, dang it. Why don't you take one right now? Okay, let me take a picture right now. Because we're going to just ham this up with some definition. Okay, gosh, that looks great, right? Um, now, I am going to blot it just to ensure that I don't have any running going on because I'm very happy with the way that looks. Okay, so let's take a picture real quick, shall we? See my camera? Okay, good enough. Let me do one more. <laughs> okay. And now let's keep going because how fast and simple was that? And super fun. So the teacup is sitting on a plate. And if we kind of, let's take a look at that gray tone again that's in the book back here. It's right here. So one one area we might want to try and highlight with the white just to see if it's going to work right there. So we need to kind of make sure there's a lip of that teacup and then that the plate looks like it recedes underneath there. So that's what we're going to work on now. And then the other thing too, I think I'll pull in just a little shadow right down there. Okay. All right. So let's, and if I have any question too, I can pull this up and see the, the definition there. So this, so this is a parchment pressing pattern. I've traced the design. Um, I know there's, I just lost the design in there. Um, again, it was quite intentional so that we can, so that I could demonstrate this really well. But I'm carefully uh, kind of creating the shape of this dish as I go. Do you want questions? Sure. Amelia's going to ask questions and I will answer as I go. We've had a couple people ask when to apply the ink tents or if you, if you apply them after quilting. Okay, great question. So uh, a few people have asked when to apply ink tents. Um, really, you can apply ink tents at any point. This, um, well, not any point. Your your project has to be at least adhered to your, uh, the fabric pieces have to be adhered to your parchment paper or your foundation panel. Okay, so that's why I wanted to show you on this because I'm also going to do it again when I pull this off and we're going to put it on the background fabric and we're going to play with it a little bit more. Um, so, and then um, you could even add some ink tents after quilting as well. So if I felt like, you know, maybe these uh, little bubbles needed a little bit more pop to them, even though this quilt is finished, I could certainly pull out my ink tents and just kind of play with that too. So, I don't think it really matters when you, but every, but your fabric pieces do have to be secure in a single collage unit. Does that answer the question? I hope. Okay. Other questions. What do you use to sharpen the pencils? Um, uh, just a, just a pencil sharpener. So someone asked, what do you use to sharpen the pencils? Amelia, I have a couple of pencil sharpeners in that drawer right there. I like that little, uh, metal, the, the steel one. You can bring that one. Lift up the lift that up. I think that's one right yeah. Okay, so this is actually um, one that this I, this is the pencil sharpener that I like to use to sharpen these. Is ink tents permanent? So someone just asked, is ink tents permanent? Um, yes. If you heat set it, and the other the other thing too is we've got to make sure that we have enough. Um, liquid for the ink to saturate the fibers of the fabric. 
So once the once the fibers have been saturated and then dry, um, they it will be permanent. But you've got to make sure that you that they that you use enough water so that they saturate into the fabric so that the ink becomes active. And that's where I, I have learned that also kind of heat setting with steam is really good. So when I peel this off and I put it on the background fabric, I'll take it over to my iron and I'll heat set it with steam. So we can see now we've got a really nice shadow coming on this plate down here. Huh? And again, I'm, I'm mixing it up with these two colors because I like, I like the way that looks having those two colors in there. So it's the willow and the violet. Have you used ink tents to draw faces? I want to put faces on the godule girls. Oh, great question. So somebody asked if I've used ink tents um, to draw faces and that they wanted to do the um, faces with the ink tents on the God Jewel pattern. That's the pattern that has the Scandinavian girls on it. Um, I used ink tents on their cheeks and um, that's all I wanted to do. I would be very, um, very careful about using um, ink tints to draw faces. Definitely, definitely practice that before you do that to your collage. Um, and and I'm a little particular about faces. I um, the it can quickly be ruined. Yeah, they can be ruined quickly and look cartoony and and um, unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Unless you really know what you're doing with drawing faces, I'd be very cautious doing faces. You could maybe just do very very simple, um, like rosy cheeks, little dots for eyes, cute little lips. I think I would have no problem with that, but I wouldn't try to get intricate with the eyes. Um, with that said. I have used ink tents a lot with animal eyes, and I think I've got an eyeball sitting around here somewhere because I wanted to show you that as well. But let's finish this up. We're almost done. And um, I hope that answered your question. So my recommendation is to be very cautious doing a face on the God Jewel girls. Maybe keep it simple. Ink tents is a perfect time to use those for little rosy cheeks, a pinpoint eyeball, um, or, you know, a pinpoint eyeball would be great with the French knot, too, in with some embroidery thread. Um, okay, so let's see. There we go. That gave it quite a bit of definition, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's see if we could add what happens when we add uh, white. Um, because this is uh, transparent, it's not entirely opaque. It's not like I can apply... You know, this is not an opaque highlighter. So that's why this is a layering process. I can always add more color to make the color darker and richer, but it's really hard to take it away or make it lighter. That's why I've never used the highlighter, but we'll give it a try on this. I've never used yellow I, or white. I just don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna work um, because that's how watercolors are. And I'm pretty familiar with using watercolor. That's why I guess I like to use water as my medium. Um, okay, so now I've got my my water. Um, I'm going to apply it to this down here. And I think this is going to turn out really intense. So I'm going to uh, be kind of careful to blot it after I get some water on there. And I'm being very careful and not about not getting it too close to that edge because it's bleeding as I apply the water. Now, the other thing too you're going to notice is um, because this is still on the parchment paper, um, it's going to make the paper kind of curl a little bit. Okay. So there's 
a little bit more. Now, the other thing too that I need to mention about ink tints is that as it dries, the intensity of the color will soften. So you can kind of already see that happening up here with the, the, teapo the teacup. Um, that shadow is just kind of mellowing out a little bit. And I expect that this also will mellow out just a, a little bit, which is what I want. Do you usually find that to create shadows, you use the color opposite your main color on the color wheel? Great question. So somebody just asked a really good question. Can you see how much ink I'm lifting up? So I'm, I've applied quite a bit of water to this so that I can dab the, um, the ink off. So somebody asked a question, do you, do you normally use the opposite color? Um, when you are creating a shadow on an object? And the answer is yes. I will um, often um, mix it. So I'll, like, I, like I've done, I pulled in that violet, but I needed to soften the violet with a little bit of brown. Um, if I'm working on something that's blue and um, I need to create a shadow with the blue, I'll use a little bit of orange or brown with a little bit more blue um, or even that's when I'll use gray or there's a color in my set that's called outliner and this color is a good kind of really light subtle gray that's the outliner color and I'll mix that with another color um, again never never do I use black or gray exclusively I will always make sure that the shadow color is an opposite opposite color to what I'm working on. I think it just makes it more painterly, more artistic. Um, I like to have a little bit of color. And I think using gray exclusively is, it just looks more amateur. So, okay, there's my little teacup. Now I can see a few areas where I need a maybe just, boy, this is really, really coming to life. Um, so let's just go ahead and finish it out. So. Pull out the pencil they're using again. Let's see, where were they? Not ink black. I don't use that. I don't, I'm not using charcoal gray. I'm using willow and violet. So another area where I think I need a little shadow or that it would be kind of fun is on the handle of the teapot right here. So keep asking questions if you have them. And Amelia is moderating the questions. There are a lot of questions. I'm just trying to. Okay, so there are a lot of questions. Amelia's trying to best. scroll through them. And um, um, lots of people are interested in seeing how you use them on animal eyes. Okay. Um, so lots of people are interested in seeing how I use them on animal eyes. Let's do that next. Someone said the outliner color does not move like the other colors. It doesn't move. Like at night. Maybe, I don't know. Okay. Um, can you redo an area after heat setting? Somebody asked, can I redo an area after heat setting? Um, just remember, again, this is layering. We can only layer more color on top of what's already there. We can't take it away. So once it's heat set, if it's too dark, I can't take that away. If it's not dark enough, yes, I can always add more color, more layers. Um, let's see here. It's really helpful to be able to look at this in the camera. Yeah. So we've got a just, I think I'm just going to emphasize this little shadow right here. Do you add water to the white pencil area? I did add water and you don't see anything, right? Like, let's try that again. Um, yeah, it's just this is an this is an uh, um what's the what's the phrase? Oh, that emphasized kind of the um I think it's kind of a batik that came out when I added a little bit of water. Uh, now let's add a little bit more in this corner here. Once heat setting, will there be no bleeding? Like if it if you throw it in the wash. Right. So once it's been heat set, that's right. There won't be bleeding. It won't continue to activate the ink. 
Could you use the pencils to draw veining on leaves? leaves. Yeah. Um, so somebody asked, could you use the pencil, the ink tints to draw veining on leaves? Um, absolutely, you could. Um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate that. Well, these leaves that I have are, we can try it. It's not. I already a, did it on those. I did just a little bit. Let's try a little bit more. Uh, but we'll let's finish this project first. So now I think that looks pretty good. I could probably continue to fuss with it, but I'd like to get it on the background fabric and then fuss with it. So I've got this beautiful reproduction, Morris reproduction print um, that I, I think that will be that will be really cute. That makes a cute block. So now this is finished. It's all been adhered. I'm going to peel the parchment paper away from the project and I can feel that that, you know, that is that fabric is wet. We have a couple of questions okay, about brushes. So now, a couple of questions about brushes. Okay, do, you, so, do you recommend soft or hard bristles? Um, great question. So let me, first of all, just remind you that this has been created on parchment paper, uh, which is the same thing as baking paper. And I, my fabric has been prepared with steam seam Light steam seam 2 is what I like. And so you can see that it's really sticky. It's still sticking to my fingers. And so now I can apply that block or that um, teacup to the block. So now I'm gonna take this over to my iron and I'm gonna iron this down and steam it. I'll actually have Amelia do that. Um, so press that down and then I wanna come back in and add a little bit more to the background fabric. So will you take that over there? Okay. So let's, uh, yeah, just, just heat press it right now because it's, it's very wet. So don't just turn the steam off for now. Okay, so here's this orchid again. Let's demonstrate um, doing some veining in these leaves. I love these leaves because they are really, really colorful. I've got lots of uh, color going on. But um, you can see I've done a little bit of uh oh, we don't want white on that we're gonna you got that okay perfect thank you um so just to i've done a little bit of ink tints underneath some of these just to kind of give it um a little bit of definition where leaves are overlapping because we want to be able to see that definition so you can kind of see i've done the ink tints already right there let's do a little bit more so first of all the colors what colors would i be using um, on green leaves. Well, um, the opposite color of green is red, right? So let's see if I've got a good kind of deep red color. Um, I have, let's see, Shiraz. I'm not really sure. It looks like it's kind of a red color. So let's test that right here and see what that is. Um, another red color that's in my uh, in my set is called chili red. So I'm going to use this. So first things first, I'm going to apply some water to those and see how they look. Just so that I understand the colors that I'm using. So that chili red is really bright, isn't that? That's the chili red. And then that's the other one. So I think this one right here is one that I will use and I will mix that with uh, another color um, just to kind of muddy it up a little bit. Um, I might want to mix it with a green. Uh, so let's see what I have. I don't want blue because that will make it purple, although that would be really pretty. Um, so we could try that. We could try mixing uh, that same indigo. Well, let's see. We've got indigo here. So just see what happens when I mix that. That's really pretty, but it's very blue. It's dark. It's what I need. Um, maybe uh, let's try green. Let's just try mixing it with green. So we've got field green. And then putting the red on top. 
Oh yeah, that's a really, that's a really good, that's a good color. I like that. Okay, so that's what I'm going to use. So um, I am going to use field green and I'm going to layer it with this Shiraz color to do some veining on these leaves. Okay, so let's just kind of create some veins. And not looking at a picture and just just adding some veins of this for this leaf. And let's do some up here too. Can you kind of see those? You'll see them as I add water. You'll see the color come out a little bit more. So I'm going to kind of go over the top of it with that field green color. Let's add maybe one more right here. Okay, so there's some, some veining. Let's see what happens when I add a little bit of water. Does the order of layering matter? Somebody just asked if the order of layering matters. Um, not really. I don't think that matters. You can play with it and see if. So did, did you answer that question about brushes? Oh, brushes. Oh, great. Um, so I, I really like a nice, uh, watercolor brush. That's what this is. Um, I probably bought this at Hobby Lobby I'm trying to see what size it is. It's a size six. It's just, a. let's see, it's a round, but it's got that nice point to it. So that's the, this is the brush that I'm using. Um, it's just a watercolor brush. Do not use an oil brush. Um, oil brushes behave very differently than watercolor brushes. So I highly recommend just getting one or two um, watercolor brushes. So this one is one that I use. And then the other uh, watercolor brush that I would get is a, a larger one that would give me, um, allow me to do bigger strokes. So on that pot that I showed earlier, I need to apply a lot of water at one time because that was a pretty big, pretty large scale. So if you want to do a wash or something, you're going to need a larger brush than a really fine tip uh, point brush. Um, okay, so, and I can go grab, um, I can grab some of my brushes that I, that I uh, actually, did I get some, I had all my brushes out earlier, but um, I guess I put them away. So the interesting thing about this, like you can see now that's given it some veining. Um, and the thing is though, there's so much going on in these leaves that you really don't need very much, right? There's, there's a lot of color and texture going on in the, in the leaves already. So we don't need a lot more definition. If I, if the leaves were, um, all one, all one color, all one fabric, I think it would show up a little bit more and be more pronounced, but as it is, they don't, they don't, we don't need a whole lot, a whole lot. Um, the only other thing I think I want to do is just add a few more. I want to add some more shadow back here. So we can, you see how I'm really shading, uh, underneath this main prominent leaf that's out front. And this I'm using just that red color, kind of a deep magenta color, right? Um, without the green. Cause I think that there's enough dark color underneath it that will show through that will um, mix this color with the, the green leaf. Okay, so 
Someone said, if I make a mistake, could I not add water before heat setting to minimize that color and then go back over it with a better color? Uh, somebody said, if I make a mistake. Um, so if you make a mistake at this point, um, your best friend is water and blotting it up, okay? And you can pretty much fix stuff like that, uh, but be careful. Um, that's, that's why you just need to be really careful. Be conservative. Remember, you can always add more, and you just need to remember that these colors intensify as you add water. Uh, but you can lift them up pretty, pretty easily with, um, now this is a time where I think letting that bleed work is really, really nice. So you can kind of see how that, that bleed from the water is bleeding out. And man, that looks like a great, that is really, really well, uh, work, working really well, creating that shadow. And just that color that I selected is working really well. I like that a lot. Isn't that pretty? Okay, cool. Fun, fun, fun. Uh, another thing, I could definitely use blue in here. Blue or purple, anything that is um, a cooler, darker uh, color. And that's kind of why I chose this red color as opposed to the warmer, brighter red. This is a very cool, cool red and it works really, really well in this. Okay, so I think I'm just about done. I could probably do some more veining on this, but I think we've done enough for now. Um, I want to go back to this other one. So let me show, let me hold this up. Lots. So that's bleeding really well in there. And as that dries, it's going to soften up just a little bit, but that's really pretty, isn't it? I like that. Okay. So let's set that aside and pull this one over again. So Here's our little, our little um, teacup. Can you see how now that that's kind of dried and she's heat set it, um, the colors are not so intense. It's a lot more subtle and I, I think that works really, really well. So now what I'm going to do just to set this off from the background fabric a little bit is I think maybe I'll just kind of outline some of this. We're just gonna play with it and see what happens, okay? So there it is. Here we are going to put it under here. And I think again, so again, the first step is choosing my color. Um, this is a sea blue. So I'm going to pull out my blues because I really want it to just kind of work with the background. So here's my sea blue color. Let's see what that looks like. That's sea blue. That looks really good, real close to that. But let's see what happens when I add water. So it's a real um, cerulean blue. I want something that's probably uh, more of a periwinkle color. So good thing I added water to that because I don't like it so much now that it has water on it. So let's let's select something else. So not sea blue. I've got a lot of blues in here. That's that's really helpful. So this is an iris blue, and that's violet. I don't think we'll do violet. Um, here's another blue bright blue and deep indigo. So lots of blue is in that 24 count uh, set. And I can see I've used this color a lot. So this is the deep indigo. That's a really, really interesting color. This is the iris blue. I think that's going to be too too light, but we'll see. And this is the bright blue. I kind of want something that's going to not conflict with the color that we have in here already. So there's the indigo. Ooh, that's the one right there. I think that's the one. But let's add a little bit more. Maybe if I mix those two a little bit. Ooh, that's pretty. Which one was that? So I think the, I think that's bright blue that I'm gonna use and a little bit of the deep indigo. So I'm gonna mix those two, okay? Just cause I like to mix. I like to see what's gonna happen. Um, okay, so let's start with the indigo. This one, deep indigo. So I just thought it would be kind of interesting 
to see if I want to make it look like it's sitting on this a little bit. Just to separate it from the background just a tad. It might be kind of fun. And let's add a little bit of that bright blue. Okay, I'm gonna take a come around and take a picture of you oh, working. Yeah, okay. Closely. You can keep going on. Okay. So oh yeah, look at that. That's so fun. Isn't that fun to see that color come out? That intense. Ooh, that's pretty. I like that. And it looks really good with this background color. What are you testing these colors on? Somebody asked, what am I testing these colors on? So this is just a piece of white cotton um, that I'm testing them on. You can see it's actually the foundation panel for the Clementine that I showed you earlier. Um, it, so any piece of white cotton or the same color that you have used in your uh, design would be helpful because you need to be able to see uh, what the color is and understand how it's going to work with the fabric that you have selected in your uh, collage. That looks so good. Yeah, kind of fun, huh? So if I want to, it might be a good idea to just outline a little bit of this too, maybe a touch right there, but I don't know. What do you think? Oh, it looks so cute. It's such a happy cup. Yeah, have a cup of tea on this cold winter day. Okay, there we go. Ta-da, that's fun. We did that in a very short time. Um, start to finish, I did this little block in an hour because I did the collage part first and then I you saw the rest of it. So there we go. I think that's an improvement on how it was. Could I keep playing with it? Yep, I could. I could keep adding more and more layers, but good enough. I think that was a great demonstration. So I hope, I hope uh, you had fun with this. And um, if you have any questions, put them in the comments and we will try to get to them in the next couple of days, um, hopefully today. But uh, let me turn this camera off because you don't need to look at that anymore. You can look at me. Okay, so if you have any questions, put them in the comments, we'll get to them. Um, you can purchase any of the supplies that I've used. So again, the ink tents are available on collagequilter.com. The pattern, uh, the teacup pattern is in my book, Collage Quilter Essentials. You can see one of the teapots on the back. And um, the orchid pattern is available as a download on collagequilter.com. So I guess that's it, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. It's been my pleasure to be with you. I hope you all had a wonderful uh, New Year's and Christmas break. I had a great time with my family, and I am so excited for 2023. I can hardly even stand it. <laughs> I'm excited to share with you what I'm working on next week. So I hope I'll see you again live next Monday at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. Okay, take care. Until then, goodbye.